Hello dear viewer and my dear student and learner. Welcome to your favorite program, The Knowledge Quest. It's time for history and government. I am your teacher, Alex Sobara. And uh, today we are proceeding with our discussions which we had in our last presentation, which was basically looking at the social, economic and political organization of Kenyan communities up to the 19th century. And uh, we were able to cover a number of uh, discussions. We discussed about the Bantu, whereby we looked at the organization of uh, some Bantu communities, for example, the Agikuyu, the Ameru. Uh, we looked at the Abagusi and the Mijikenda. And then uh, we went further still and discussed on uh, the social, political, and economic organization of the Nilot communities and specifically we discussed about the Luo and uh, we were proceeding with the discussion on the Bant on, on uh, the Nilots and uh, we looked at the, uh, their social organization. We also looked at the political organization which I just want to give you a brief recap of what we discussed on their political organization and then uh, we shall proceed to their economic organization in that order. So among the points which we discussed in our last lesson, we say that the basic political unit among the uh, Nandi was the family. And many related families formed a neighborhood called uh, the Kokuo, right? So those Kokuo, when they came together, Kokuet, they formed a Bororiet, which was headed by a council of elders whose functions and roles we discussed, including maintaining law and order, settling major disputes. They were the final court of appeal, they negotiated for peace and declared war. They advised uh, warriors on when and when to organize uh, raids and wars. And of course, they also presided over uh, religious functions. And then we looked at another political organization that after circumcision, young men who joined the warriors um, defended the community from outside attack or external aggression or communities who uh, were attacking from outside. And then we also say that we also saw that this community had an office of Orko Yacht, or we can call it the institution. So an office is more of an institution. So sometimes you are told to discuss the roles of the institution of the Orko Yacht. So some of those functions or duties of the Orko Yacht included, number one, he presided over religious functions. He advised the Council of Elders on running of the community. He advised and blessed warriors before raids or wars, right? And then uh, he arbitrated in cases or disputes between a clan and another. He foretold the future. He acted as a rainmaker and a medicine person or medicine man. And lastly, he acted as a leader, as a political leader, and was consulted on matters of power from one age group to another. And uh, we went further and looked now what we want to discuss in this case is to look at the economic organization. So that's why we'll start our lesson today, to look into the economic organization of the Nandi. And uh, like I told you last time, economic organization is basically focusing on how they made their livelihood, their daily uh, living in as far as their survival is concerned. So the first um, a point or the first economic activity is that these people were livestock keepers. So they kept cattle, sheep and goat and of course you know the cattle sheep and goat provided meat they provided um, meat uh, milk and of course heightened skins which were used in various ways and then apart from being pastoralists and um, livestock keepers they also were farmers who cultivated a number of crops including sorghum millet and sweet potatoes all right so these are some of the crops which um, the nandi uh, cultivated so they could be able to use that as their food. And then also another, another, I mean another economic organization or um, activity, they were iron workers. That's to mean that they were able to make a number of tools uh, from iron, including uh, spearheads, right? Hoes, knives, dagger, and arrowheads, right? So these were a number of uh, uh, examples of tools which were made by the Nandi 
uh, as an economic activity which they could of course exchange and they could use for their various activities uh, for purposes of livelihood. Another economic activity which I talked about last time is that they raided their neighbors for livestock. Remember we said the were coyote also advised uh, the young warriors when they were going to war and of course raiding. So raiding was an economic activity. That is they were um, attacking or they could go to a neighboring community, steal from them and then uh, of course the, whatever they stole was used for their economic advantage. So they raided their neighbors uh, for livestock so they could be able to use it for survival. And then uh, another economic activity of the Nandi during the 19th century is that they practiced craft industries. All right, they practiced craft industries. Or you can say they had skills in art and craft. Example, pottery, that is making of pots, leather work, and basketry. So they could use the leather um, from the animals, of the skin animals, and uh, in making a number of tools. So they had skills in art in uh, craft. And then also another economic activity of uh, the Nandi, which is the last one, is that they practiced beekeeping. And of course, practicing beekeeping, you know, at the end of it, the end result is honey, which they got from uh, keeping the bee. And this honey could be consumed, of course. And apart from being consumed, it could be exchanged for other um, commodities which they never produced um, as a community. So that is the economic organization uh, of uh, the Nandi community, which is a group of, um, uh, the, it's among the groups form of the Kalenjin speaking group. All right, so having looked at uh, the Nandi and summarized, we'll move into the next uh, um, Nilot community, the Plain Nilot, that's the Maasai. And uh, we will uh, dissect again, look at the social organization. We we'll look at their political organization and we will look at their uh, economic organization of this uh, language known as the Maasai. And we say the Maasai, like we discussed in our last discussion, they form part of the Plain Nilots. Okay? So they are also part of the mass speaking community, the Maasai. So their social organization include the following. Number one, the society was organized into clans. That is to simplify and mean that basic social unit was a clan, right? So the society was organized into clans. And then uh, at puberty, that is to mean at the stage of moving from, uh, young, from young people to adulthood, girls were initiated through, boys and girls were initiated through circumcision, all right? Also important to note that uh, we had boys and girls among the Maasai. At puberty, boys and girls were initiated through circumcision, and after that, they joined an age set. So, age sets were normally classified with people who belong to the same age group or age set in that case, and um, they could also, you know, form that age set. And then also, they believed in the existence of one supreme God, or you can say, existence of a supernatural being, God whom they called Enkai, all right? And this uh, Enkai was the creator God. In other words, everything that existed, including the Maasai themselves, they believed that Enkai was their creator. Enkai, or God, was their creator. The Laibon was their leader, all right? Prayed the Enkai on behalf of the people. Okay, so that is a social organization. That's how they approach their God. So he was like the mediator, between people, uh, uh, the Maasai and the, the God. So the Laibon stood in the position uh, and um, prayed on behalf of the people. And then also, <coughs> uh, we had uh, another social uh, organization that there was a warrior class, a class of warriors, or also called the Morans. Okay, there's a class of warriors. So these are very important uh, organization among the Maasai. And uh, they had a number of duties. The Morans had a number of duties, which included the following. Number one, the Morans defended the community. That's defending the community from external aggression and from external attacks from the neighboring communities or from any other in intruder that would want to, uh, you know, attack their community or even still the animals. Because we will discuss in a short 
a while that uh, the Maasai were livestock keepers who were so passionate about uh, their livestock. So they were defended uh, the community. Number two, they conducted raids. This is also one of the economic activities among the Maasai, conducting raids. That's going to neighboring community and raiding or taking away the animals. It was an accepted economic activity. So the Morans had that role of conducting raids. Okay, so they will organize, and after organizing, they will agree to which community to go. If it's the Kipsigis community, or if it's the Abagusi community, or if it's the Luo, they are neighboring communities, and then they could uh, carry out uh, the raiding, which was uh, used to improve on the economic sustainability. And then uh, lastly, they also surveyed grazing areas. Like I said, you can remember, I said that the Maasai are by nature pastoralists. They are people, they are pastoralists who are so passionate. That is to mean that um, they kept animals in large numbers. So they surveyed grazing areas and uh, they had large tracts of land, very large tracts of land. So they surveyed them and of course kept uh, those lands uh, in tandem as their own. So having looked at the social organization of the Maasai, I want us now to move into the next, which is the political organization of the Maasai community. The political organization of the Maasai community. And uh, we will start by discussing on the basic, com uh, basic unit of the political organization. And in this case, the clan was the basis of political organization. It was the basis of political organization to imply that it was the main unit of political organization among the Maasai as an allotic group. And um, another point is that the leadership was through a council of elders. So the clans were headed by a council of elders. And this council of elders had the following duty. So as you can note, most of uh, the African political systems had a system called council of elders, most of them which we have discussed. And those councils of elders had roles which were specific. So in this case, among the Maasai, the leadership was through a council of elders whose duties included the following. Number one, maintaining law and order, right? That is to mean that if there was anyone or anybody who was planning or purportedly uh, broke the law, the law, such a person uh, could be summoned by the Council of Elders and uh, in that case disciplined, that will help others to maintain the law and order. Number two, uh, the Council of Elders also settled disputes. Yeah, So disputes could arise in a number of ways and at different levels. It could be at family level, it could be at clan level or inter-community level. So those disputes which are um, you know, um, came up, uh, the Council of Elders was the one that was responsible for settling those, those disputes uh, among uh, the members of the Maasai community. And then they also had a responsibility or a duty of declaring war and raids, okay? So why in this case we say if there is a community that is an aggressor or if there is a community that is uh, interfering with their peace, they'll have to come out and, of course, defend their community. So the Council of Elders will announce and say that uh, we're going to have war with Community A or Community B or Community C. And then, of course, they could also declare raids that this month or this year, our raiding activities will be on this community, right? So that was a responsibility or a duty which was bestowed upon uh, the, the Council of Elders among uh, the Maasai. Then uh, there was also the office of the Libon. There was also the office of the Libon, who, through a religious, who, although who was a religious leader, acted as a unifying factor. All right. So it was also like a unifying factor. It was, um, uh, it was uh, like what we call um, currently a symbol of unity. When we will be discussing about the Kenyan government, we we'll look at the symbols of national unity. So in this case here, the Libon is a source of unity, is, like, is an inspiration for the Maasai to un unite and be uh, one thing in that uh, case. So having looked at the political organization, which I summarized as it is, 
we'll now look at the economic organization of the Maasai. And of course, economic organization, just to remind again that we are talking about a way of making daily livelihood. So what were some of the activities which the Maasai did as a way of making their daily livelihood? So number one, they were nomadic pastoralists. So the word nomadic which is introduced here meaning these are our people who are moving from one place to another in search of pastures and water for their animals. So they were nomadic pastoralists and apart from that they kept a number of animals which included cattle, goats, sheep and donkeys. All right? So they were nomadic in nature. They could move from one place uh, to another in search of water and pasture. Another economic activity of the Maasai is that uh, uh, they traded with their neighbors. Remember we said some of the neighbors around the Maasai included the Luo, uh, the Kipsigis community, and the Abagusi, right? So they could trade among these communities. That is to mean they could take the animal products to those communities, and uh, those communities instead will give them uh, farm products. So they traded with their neighbors and the form of trade or the mode of trade which was used here mainly was barter trade which was exchange of goods for goods. Another economic activity which I think we've largely talked about is uh, raiding. Okay? Raiding, this meant that uh, they could uh, go to their neighboring communities and steal the animals that these communities had. So that was also um, an economic activity in the sense that they increase their economic strength or stamina. So they could raid from their neighbors for cattle and uh, mostly um, uh, among the Kisi and the Maasai community this was very common that they could steal from one another uh, or raid from one another. In that case as an economic activity. And of course you realize that the Maasai, the Maasai were also divided into two groups. We have a group which was mainly uh, keeping livestock, who are nomadic pastoralists in nature, these were called the Purko Masai. The Purko Masai are the ones who are very common in uh, keeping animals, but we also had another group of Masai who were farmers. They are called the Kwavi. The Kwavi Masai uh, are the ones also carried out another economic activity which included growing crops. They grew crops like millet, sorghum, finger millet and several vegetables all right so the kwabi maasai are also part of uh, the maasai and the one of the economic activities like we said it was growing crops so we cannot completely rule out that the maasai uh, were you know uh, pastels per se we can also say that also did farming where through the kwabi maasai and i'll say that uh, the purko maasai are the ones who are mainly livestock keepers and then um Another economic activity is they were iron workers and they produced a number of tools and um, this included spears, right? Spears which could be used for war. They also in, uh, introduced things like ornaments, all right? They also did things like hose and arrowheads, all right? So these were some of the things which the Maasai uh, produced as one of their economic activities. And then uh, also, they did leather work and used hides to make beads, sandals, clothes, and bags and belts. And of course, this is one of the economic activities which they also carry out to date, that they use uh, uh, leather from uh, the animals and they use, they, they steal, and they used to make a number of things like ornaments, they made beds, they made sandals, clothes, and bags, and belts, all right? So those leather belts, of course, if you walk along the streets today, you can still find most of them are made by the Maasai. So this is an economic activity which did not just begin yesterday. It's an activity which has been done since the 19th to the 20th century. Um, also, another economic activity is that they hunted wild animals and gathered vegetable roots and fruits. So there was also an aspect of hunting and gathering which if you're keen has been appearing across several communities so they did hunting and gathering hunting wild game and also gathering uh, vegetables roots and fruits which they could use to supplement 
uh, their diet. So those are some of the economic organizations uh, of uh, the Maasai as one of uh, uh, the, the Nilotic speaking groups. So having discussed on the Nilots, our next discussion will now be on the Kushites. However, uh, uh, before we proceed this, we're going to take a short break. And then when we come back, we'll be able to delve into the Kushites and look at their social, political, and economic organization. Keep safe and see you shortly. Welcome back after that break and uh, let us proceed uh, with uh, our discussion. And now our last discussion uh, in this topic will focus mainly on the last um, group language group as the Kushites. And uh, in the Kushites we'll uh, largely discuss about the Borana and the Maasai. I mean I'm under the Somali, sorry. So we look at the Borana and the Somali as part of the Kushite and then uh, that will mark the end of our uh, lesson or a discussion in this chapter about the socio economic and political organization of, a of Kenyan communities in the 19th century. So, the Borana are uh, also a part of the Kenyan communities, the Kushites, and uh, this is how their social organization was or currently could be. So, the first one, social life was centered on the nuclear family, a number which formed uh, the clan. So the nuclear family was the, like the basic social unit and then um, when those several nuclear families were brought together to form extended families and eventually they formed a clan. Right? So we start by saying that the, the, the basic social unit among the Borana was the family. Of course in this case we had the nuclear family and then a number of families formed the clan. So a clan was formed of men families brought together. And then uh, the camp, the camp was the residential section during ceremonial rites, after which they dispersed into their nomadic life. So these people, the nomad, I mean the Borana, eh, by nature or by trade, they were nomads. That's they moved from one place to another. However, you realize that they had a, a common camp, right? So this camp, was a temporary home so it was a residential section mostly during ceremonial rites and after those ceremonies were ended they will disperse to their nomadic life so if a ceremony was about circumcision they could go to their you know to their camp stay there carry out the ceremonial rites and then after the rites are done they go back to their nomadic life moving from one place to another to look for water and pasture uh, for their animals and then uh, another social organization is that the Borana had an age set structure called Gada, all right? Where the most powerful person will be identified and he presided over village meetings. So that age structure was called Gada. So like um, those age structure groups were put together, to, uh, then they formed the Gada. And then uh, out of this, there was the most powerful person, uh, or probably basing on um, their prowess or their, their activity or the activeness in doing some things, probably in war and all that, he would be identified. And such a person presided over village meetings, all right? So that was the person who presided over village meetings. He also proclaimed laws and presided over religious ceremony so likely you can say it was like an elder but you see it was a system whereby he was selected from an age set structure okay so probably they not look at the age per se they looked at the prowess or the power of that person in doing some things so from there that person was identified as a leader and uh, he could lead in that case and then uh, also the Burana had two kinship groups one could only marry from a kinship outside their own. That means that they were like two clans. And therefore, those two clans or kinships, each kinship could not marry from within their kinship. They could marry from outside. That means the other alternative uh, kin. 
So at what we say probably is called exogamy or exogamous. They had two kinship groups and one could only marry from a kinship outside their own. Then uh, there was also division of labor. That is to mean that uh, work was divided amidst amongst the people in the community. That is from the men to the women to the children, depending on um, how they had socialized. So there was division of labor. And then um, we also had elders among the Borana who presided over court cases. That is to mean sometimes we had disputes or disagreements or cases which weren't needed the attendance of the elders so they could preside over uh, those cases. And then lastly, but not least, on their socio-organization, they also believed in the existence of a supernatural God um, who they called Wak. All right? So they worshipped one God, the creator, whom they called Wak in their language. So basically, that is the socio-organization of uh, the Koshites, socio of the Borana in that case. So we move and look at their political organization. Political organization. So the first point you need to note here is the political organization was based on kinship. And I said in the social organization, they had two kinships in that case. So each kinship had their own kind of system. The society was divided into two clans. All right, That's why we say it was based on kinship. Uh, each headed by hereditary leader who was a ritual leader and judge in major conflict. That's to mean that uh, we had a leader who was who inherited. When we talk about heredity, hereditary is a form of leadership which was inherited from the father or from the predecessor in that case. So the society was divided into two clans. Each was headed by hereditary leader who was a ritual leader and a judge in major conflict. So in case there are conflicts which were major, which could um, of course range from land to family to any other form of a uh, um, conflict, it was uh, the hereditary leader in this case who was the judge you could give a ruling. And then uh, of course the, the political organization, they also had a council of elders. These council of elders had the following duties. Number one, settling disputes okay so this uh, settling disputes maintaining law and order okay so to ensure that there was a upholding of the law in the land or rather among the people in that case and then there was also organizing defense against external aggression so if we had people who probably were aggressors from external from outside would want to you know in any way attack the community then it was up to uh, the council of elders to organize young men to defend their community from external aggressor and then uh, another political organization is the exit system provided a military base for the society that is to mean they provide defense uh, for the community or the society against external aggressors from a community which would want to attack or even sometimes want to raid uh, the uh, Borana community in that case. So that is all about the political organization of um, uh, the Borana. Let's look at the economic organization, how they were organized in terms of their making their daily livelihood and in terms of, uh, you know, making their survival during the 19th century. So the first economic organization of this community is that they were nomadic pastoralists who kept ships. Nomadic, I said, nomadic basically means that they were people who kept livestock but moved from one place to another. They were not permanent. They were moving in nature. So they were nomadic pastoralists who kept cattle and uh, sheep and goats. So these are uh, sheep, goat and cattle, of course, as you know, will provide them a number of materials or a number of things like food, like meat, okay, like milk, uh, sometimes blood, and of course, they could also get uh, skins and hides, which was uh, uh, very important in that aspect. And then uh, number three, they also traded with their neighbors. That is, they carried out what called butter trade, exchanging their goods with others' goods, of course, those which they never uh, were able to have or produce. And then uh, there is also an aspect of hunting and gathering. They were hunters and gatherers. That is to mean that... Um, they could go to look for game meat, okay, 
and of course fruits and vegetables and roots this was meant to supplement their diet that was meant to supplement their diet and their survival and then also uh, since these are uh, Borana people lived along river Tana they also cultivated food crops okay so examples of uh, millet finger millet yam and cassava so they cultivated food crops along river Tana also we can say in some sense they were also farmers who produced some crops and then uh, another point uh, about the economic organization they had craft industries they were skilled they had skills in art and craft and that means that women made baskets and leather products Leather products will range from sandals they range from beds and all that and then the men made wooden tools uh, weapons and utensils okay so they had the skill of uh, carving that is they could carve uh, hood into different uh, tools and commodities and then lastly but not least since they also lived along river Tana uh, they practiced fishing okay so they could use our uh, fishing uh, as one of their food along river Tana where they could be able to fish so those are the economic activities of the Borana as a Kushaitic community uh, during the 19th century so our next discussion will take us to the last phase of, um, of these uh, social, political, and economic organization of Kenyan communities in the 19th century, and that is the Somali. Okay, so this is the last one which we look, we discuss into, and uh, probably will be the last one which we'll be looking in our discussions uh, today. So the social organization of the Somali, and uh, if you can remember also we said the Somali, they form part of... Um, the Kenyan communities who fall under a language group referred to as the Kushites. And uh, the first is that the Somali were divided into clans. That implies that the clans were the basic social unit. They were divided into clans. They had also the age set system which circumcised boys belonged. So those boys who had been uh, circumcised belonged to an age set system. Okay? So it means that they were moving from puberty to adulthood. They could be circumcised, and then after being circumcised, they would belong to uh, the age set system. And then uh, another social, uh, you know, organizational belief of these people, they believed in the existence of one God, whom they called Wak. All right? So basically, if you look at the name they called their God, and the name the Borana called God is the same. So they believed in the existence of one God called Wak, and had religious leaders who mediated for them. That is, leaders who could go and pray on their behalf. Okay? And then uh, duties also were divided according to gender. Okay? So it means that uh, there was social socialization, that people were trained on the kind of activities they could do depending on their gender. So there were those activities which were meant for the male gender and there were activities which were meant for the female gender. All right, and then uh, in the 16th century, they convert into Islam and therefore they embraced Islamic culture. So their culture was largely Islamic in nature. We can't say that they were, you know, African traditionists or in any way they embraced Islam in the 16th century, okay, at the coming of the Arabs uh, in Kenya. So the next. Um, our almost last discussion in that case is political organization and um, we will look at how they were organized politically we will look at how they were organized in their political organization so the first one that is the smallest political organization was the clan okay the smallest political organization was the clan and uh, the clan was headed by the council of elders the clan was headed by the council of elders who, number one, maintained law and order. So in other words, we are looking at the functions or the duties of the Council of Elders among the Somali. So the first one is maintaining law and order to ensure people live according to the law or the moral code of the society. And then uh, they also settled disputes. In this case, we mean that uh, in case there were disagreements, among uh, the society, among the people in the uh, Somali society, 
it was the role of the council of elders to settle those disputes. And then uh, they also presided over religious ceremonies. And uh, religious ceremonies ranged, there were a number of ceremonies which included, but not limited to, uh, offering of sacrifices to the God, in that case we called work. So they preside over those ceremonies and ensure that they were done the right way. Also, we have also they had a, a military organization. That is, from the young men who were circumcised and got into the EDGESET system, they established a military organization that defended the community. Right? So um, the military organization in this case was basically uh, composed of young men uh, who had been circumcised. All right? And therefore they could defend their community from any form of external aggression or any form of attack from their rela or their neighbors or from their enemies in that case. And uh, lastly, uh, but not least, their political setup changed with the introduction of Islam. That means that largely uh, their political system, which you've seen here, changed having been simul uh, assimilated into a different system of political culture. That is to mean they changed their system of political organization largely borrowed from the Arab or from the Islam system of political organization. That's why we are saying here that their political setup changed. That is in the 16th century with the introduction of Islam among uh, the Somali. So the last uh, aspect we'll discuss today and come to the end of our discussion is the economic organization. We look at the economic organization, which is our last subtopic as we come to the end of this topic. So talking about the economic organization still, uh, we are looking at on how they made their daily livelihood. And therefore, among the things, the number of activities they did economically were number one, they were hunters and gatherers, right? They were hunters and gatherers to mean they went into the game, right? They went to look for meat, to look for fruits, vegetables, and roots which could supplement their common diet. So we say they were hunters and gatherers. Number two, they were nomadic pastoralists. That is to imply that they kept animals which they moved with from one place to another in search of water and pasture for these very animals. So that implies they didn't just sit or camp at one place with the animals. No, no, no. They moved with the animals from one place to another. That's why we call them nomadic pastoralists. Examples of animals they kept included camels, all right? Cattle, goats, and sheep. Of course, when we talk about camels, it can tell you that these people lived in uh, dry areas. When we talk about camels, those are animals who survive in arid and semi-arid areas. So uh, they kept camels, cattle, goats, and sheep. And then uh, also they traded with their neighbors that is basically the Pokomo and the Mijikenda. So the Pokomo and the Mijikenda also happened to form part of um, you know, the neighboring communities of the Somali. Therefore, they carried out trade. And basically, the kind of trade which they carried out was butter trade, which we discussed in a, uh, a number of less, uh, lessons back. So they carried out butter trade by exchanging what they had with what they did not have. Then, um, a number, another economic aspect or activity which the Somali carried out, there was a section of the Somali people who practiced iron working. There was a section who practiced iron working. That is to mean they were able to make a number of tools from iron, including spearheads, knives, daggers, and hoes, right? And then uh, lastly, but not least on this aspect, they practiced craft. That is, they had skills in crafting and art. They made a number of uh, implements, including pottery, that is uh, the art of making pots, and of course weaving, where they made a number of products. So these are the economic activities uh, of the Somali. So ladies and gentlemen, my dear student, 
that brings us to the end of our discussion on the social, economic, and political organization of the Kenyan communities. And we have majorly focused on case studies. We have picked a number of communities uh, from the Bantus, from the Nilots, and the Kushites, because these are the main language groups uh, in Kenya. And therefore, what I want you to note that in our discussion, as you are, uh, as you are looking at, on this organization, something very important for us to note is that Africans had their own organization. They had their own organization even before the coming of the colonial masters, as we say. And um, you realize that these organizations tended to be similar. These organizations tended to be similar, uh, ranging from socio, economic, and political. And um, that is to mean that Africans had their own system of leadership. They had their, they had their own system of economy. They had their own social systems which were in place. And therefore, I just want to give you some of the common uh, questions which you may be asked um, about this topic. Sometimes um, the question may come that you discuss on the social polit or social political so, or socioeconomic. So in such a question which this wants you to discuss on the socioeconomic, the examiner is mostly interested in both social and economic. So if the question has 10 marks, it means you give five social and five economic, all right? So don't be confused if you say, um, if a question comes and says, sir, discuss the socio-economic organization of the Bantu or the socio-economic organization of the Abagusi. So basically in that case, you are required to discuss both the social and economic. Or if it is socio-political, it is both the social and political organization. And uh, it is very clear that it is easier for you to understand on some of the organizations. It's easier, all right? So, for example, the economic activities cut across. You look at some of the activities like keeping livestock, farming, all right? Art and craft or crafting. All right, so it is an easy kind of um, chapter which should not give you a lot of trouble, more so when it comes to answering questions. So what you need to understand is that most of the activities which Africans were doing as part of their social and economic organization cut across most of the African communities, except some of the communities who were, which were majorly I mean, um, nomadic pastoralists, and those are mainly the plain nylots, and um, the Kushites, whom we have uh, already discussed. So therefore, I think uh, up to that level, we will uh, sum up our topic and uh, just say that uh, find time to go through all these notes. In our next lesson, I'll give out some of the questions which you'll expect to be uh, examined in that area. So that marks the end of our discussion for today. God keep you safe and see you in our next discussion. Goodbye.